All righty, everybody. Everybody all in? Come on in. We're going to go through a lot today. A lot, a lot, a lot. So uh, come closer. Make sure you can see the screen. Make sure the font is large enough. Uh, while people are settling in, please grab the, uh, the coordinates up there. That GitHub repository, for example, is a three-day lab that I give that covers most of what we're going to talk about here today um, uh, in depth. And so there's exercises that you can follow along with, do them at your own leisure, et cetera. And of course, I'm on the internet. I'm happy to talk to you if you have questions, uh, comments, feedback, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you have questions, comments, feedback, and you want to talk, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, how many of you, by show of hands, are on Twitter? Twitter. Twitter. OK, good stuff. Right on. Uh, if you're on Twitter, that's awesome. That's the right place to be. Uh, and I'm playing a game of Spring One Platform Go where I'm trying to catch, get selfies with all my favorite Spring engineers. So maybe you can help me track them down like Pokemon. Um, if you're not on Twitter, how many of you are on email? How many of you have email? Email. E email. Anybody? No? Nobody. OK, well, I'm available on either one of those. I'm happy to talk to you if you have questions, comments, feedback. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, as I say before, I'm very happy to talk to you. So OK, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go through a lot today. How many of you were in Spring 1 last year? Spring 1 last year. OK. Few of you. So. What we're going to talk about today is uh, the talk is called Cloud Native Java, and it's you know, largely a summation, a very, very quick summation, if you will, of uh, some of the stuff that I've been working on elsewhere. Right? Uh, I'm an engineer. I'm an open source contributor. I'm the number one, number one, top ranked, most prolific contributor uh, of bugs, but still number one to, to projects like Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Spring Batch, Spring Integration. Bot and time leaf activity. More bugs per commit than any other contributor. Seven years. Seven years in a row. Um, so I'm an open source engineer. I work on open source. I, 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 I do as much as I can to help the community, and that's been uh, a privilege of mine. And one of the benefits of that is I've been nominated as a, or you know, granted the title of Java champion, for which I'm very grateful. And it means that basically I get to spend a lot of time with amazing folks like yourselves uh, trying to help people level up in software, right? And a lot of that is today uh, to do with using Spring. And so on that basis, I've done books. I've done um, training videos. This is the latest and greatest book on which I'm still, for reasons yet unknown, toiling. It's called Cloud Native Java with my buddy Kenny Bastani, uh, who's here also. Um, and uh, the book, is, uh, the book has features as its cover animal, for those of you who are wondering, and most people do wonder, that's a, a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a blue-eared kingfisher from the Javanesian islands in Indonesia. So it's a, it's a bird, you see, that lives in the clouds, because they fly. They're birds. And it's native to the Java islands. It's a cloud native Java. No? OK, it's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. It'll come. It'll just, it's fine. Uh, anyway, that, that's uh, the book. And uh, I've also done training videos, uh, uh, the latest and greatest of which, of course, is building microservices with Spring Boot Live Lessons, which I did with my friend and, uh, and Spring Boot lead, Phil Webb, who you saw speak in the uh, keynote this morning, uh, and who brought emoji uh, slides to the next level. Right. So there's that. And I work at Pivotal. And at Pivotal, as you've probably uh, no doubt understood at this point, at Pivotal we care very much about helping customers, community members, and organizations move quickly and safely from concept, from product management, if you will, to production. And while we have lots of great open source stuff, uh, and while we work on great open source stuff, that's a, a key uh, differentiator for us, it is not our raison d'etre. It's not the reason we're here. We care about that agility. And a lot of organizations are struggling with this. They have they understand that they have to be able to go faster, and they understand that there are places where they need to go faster in the value chain. Obviously, a huge part of it in an organization, and transforming an organization, is to transform the culture, make the culture more able to accommodate faster iteration. And you do that by accommodating better communication. Uh, if the cost of communication between teams is significant, then it stifles your ability to innovate faster. So you want to reorient your organization in terms of the uh, team dynamics that make best sense for your software. Uh, if you do this, what you're doing is you're decomposing your software in terms of small features. You're decomposing your software in terms of small feature, features upon which a small group of people can focus, a small feature that a small group of people can evolve, a small group feature that a small group of people can uh, focus and then evolve and then deploy independent of the rest of the organization, of the rest of the software. What we're talking about is a microservice. 
a microservice is a unit of organizational agility. It helps you as an organization go faster because it lets you stay in your own lanes, so to speak. It lets you build software and stay in your own lanes as you're building it. And so this is very, very useful, but there are a couple of side effects to this move. If you move to microservices, if you move to this, this architecture, what happens is you invite complexity. You invite complexity that's associated with the cost of standing up new services and then managing the implicit complexity uh, of having to manage distributed systems, right? If you've got a distributed system, then you've got complexity involved in that. Uh, and of course, once you've built this distributed system, you need to make sure that all the services are production worthy. And once you've made them all production worthy, you have to manage them. So to stand, to stand up new services quickly, safely, consistently, we well, can use Spring Boot to manage these applications in a production system to be able to scale them out, to handle load balancing, to handle security, to handle automation of the operational environment for the software, we can use Cloud Foundry. But today, we're going to look at how to manage that complexity involved in building a distributed system. We're going to look at that using Spring Cloud. So how many of you have heard of Spring Cloud? Good stuff. Hot sauce. Well done. So we're going to go ahead and cover some old stuff and some new stuff, because I'm not sure what people are aware of and what they're not. So we're going to go through a little bit of everything today. Now, as people are settling in, it's, it's incumbent upon me to get a selfie. So uh, on my mark, when I say open source, you all say open source, and then smile and pretend to be happy, OK? Ready? Steady. Open source. And you left. OK, good. Thank you. Good stuff. All right. So we're going to go quick today. We don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. We have uh, an hour and 50 minutes, and we're going to go through a lot of code. And if I'm honest, you're not going to be able to follow along unless uh, you've already seen this before. So if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't seen this before, give yourself the chance to, to absorb it all. We're going to go very fast. The goal is not that you remember everything that I've typed. The goal is that you remember what is possible. And then on your own time, it's going to be easy to follow up, right? because there are great resources out there. So. What we're going to do is we're going to begin our journey today here at start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet. Uh, remember, my first favorite place on the internet is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go to production as often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. It's amazing. The weather's nice. It's the happiest place on Earth. Production is better than Disneyland. But if you're not already in production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you want for inspiration in the early mornings before your cup of tea or coffee, start that spring that I owe. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion, perhaps after too many nights here in Vegas, partying at the greatest conference on earth, start that spring that I owe. Keep it close to your heart, bookmark it, keep it ready at all times. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a very simple service. I'm going to call it the reservation service. And I'm going to use different Spring technologies to build this application. We're going to use Spring's web support. We use H2, which is an embedded in-memory uh, SQL database. And because it's in-memory, it's going to lose all of its state on every restart. So in this way, it's very similar to MongoDB. Uh, we're going to use the config client. That's a joke, friends, because Mongo doesn't keep data. It's a spreadsheet that doesn't have a UI. Get it? No? It's fine. Anyway, config client uh, for centralized configuration. We're going to use Eureka for service registration and discovery. We'll use Zipkin for distributed tracing. We we'll use RabbitMQ for stream processing. We we'll use REST repository support. Uh, and we're going to use JPA, the Java Persistence API, uh, because I make poor life decisions. So JPA. We're going to also bring in Actuator for operational concerns, right? for observability use cases. And then that, my friends, ought to do. Now, naturally, I could elect to switch here to the full version, whereupon I'll be given a veritable ocean of checkboxes, things that I could elect to select and bring into my application if I wanted. But I don't need to in this case. I've already made my selections, and I'm happy with what I've got. Now, it's worth noticing that we're going to use the latest and greatest Spring Boot 1.4.0. That just came out last week for you, right? So that's cool. Now, we also have here uh, uh, some choices that you, uh, you might take a look at, you might be wondering about. Uh, first of all, which language would you like to use? Any language on the JVM that supports annotations and objects will work just fine. So Java, Scala, Groovy, Kotlin, etc. Great, no problem. But these are, my friends, these are non-choices. These are choices that you could make, but that you should never, ever, ever make, ever. For example, which version of the JVM would you like to use? 
as both 1.6 and 1.7 are end of life, they're gone. They're dead. They're extinct. They're dinosaurs. They're irrelevant. They're no longer supported, not available, expired, past their due, more than a year old beyond past end of life. To use either one of these is a terrible idea. And, and WebSphere, by the way, is no excuse. And then here we have the choice of packaging. And again, people get very confused about this. They don't know when and where to choose which. So it's always worth reiterating you know, the options here, when and where to, to approach which choice. Uh, if by some crazy freak fluke of physics, some terrible accident of physics, you find yourself stuck in the very, 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 very distant past, far, 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 far beyond modern help, then choose dot war. <laughs> but if you're here with me in 2016, then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. Now again, you have options. You have choices. You should do what works for you, which in this case coincides with what I've told you to do. So how's that for a double win? OK? Did you get your photo, my friend? Good. All right, let's do this. So I'm going to go ahead and build a service. And uh, again, I'm not going to focus too much on Spring Boot. There are plenty of other sessions in which to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to build a simple API with which we can work. And then we're going to look at some of the patterns, the complexities, that naturally sort of become a problem once you start to scale out and have lots of collaborating uh, services distributed over the network. So our service will be the same kind of service I always typically build. It'll be a service that manages entities of type reservation. Uh, let's go back to our build here. And I'm going to. Uh, you know, we will, for now, comment out a few bits that we don't care about. Actually, we can just leave them all in. No, let's just leave them all in for now. We're going to go back to our code, and I'm going to build a JPA entity. Let me make the font here a little bit smaller for uh, ease of uh, absorption from, this, from the outside here. It's a little too big, don't you think? So Josh's default. OK. How's that? Can everybody still read that in the back? Somebody throw your hand. OK, good. Good. So we're going to build a JPA entity of type reservation. And I'm going to manage ent uh, entities with a primary key. So I'll signal as much using generated value annotations. JPA is generated value annotation. I'll give it a private field here called reservation underscore name in the column, you know, in the database like this. Uh, I'm going to signal this a JPA entity by using the at entity annotation. And then I need to be able to you know, uh, work with this object as a regular job object. So I'll add some getters. I'll add a constructor. I'll add a, another constructor entirely for JPA's benefit. Right? Uh, I'll create a two string. And uh, then I want to be able to read and write and save and work with and manipulate instances of this type in the database. So I'll create a Spring Data JPA repository. Now, JPA, uh, Spring Data, rather, is a uh, te technology that has many different modules, one of which is JPA. But there are others for Cassandra, MongoDB, et cetera. And what I want to do is I want to make this a REST API. And so I've got Spring Boot started data REST, which makes it trivial for me to then annotate this as a, as a REST resource. Oops. Come on, computer. There we are. And, uh, and then finally, I want to create some sample data. So I'll say class sample data CLR implements command line runner. And the command line runner is a callback interface in Spring Boot. When Spring Boot starts up, it's going to find methods of this type, beans of this type this, that implement this interface. It's going to call the run method, giving us a chance to, to um, it's going to call the run method, giving us a chance to do any kind of application initialization. And I'm going to do so in my application. I'm going to inject my repository here, and I'm going to create some sample records. So stream.of, and I will say uh, that we want to have, doc well, let me see. We'll say, my name is Josh, so we'll add that. We'll add the one and only, the amazing, the inimitable Jurgen. We'll add Andrew. We'll add um, uh, Bridget this morning, and Antsy, and Phil, the amazing Phil. And uh, let's see, who else should we add? Uh, Stefan, of course. There we are. Thank you. And we can add uh, Cornelia, the one and only. So that, my friends, is, uh, what is that? That's eight. That's a nice, even number. And then I'm going to iterate through each one. I'm going to say, for each name in that collection, save a record in the database like this. Right? So all I'm doing is I'm just creating some sample records so that we have something that we can work with later on in the balance of our talk. And then just to confirm everything's working, I'll it visit every record like that. Okay. Now, system.outprintline, I'm using a Java 8 feature here. Uh, and when that starts up, it's going to write data to the database. Now, we can s it, the database itself will be based on H2, which we've already got on the class path. So we don't need to do much more to, to get that to work. Let me see here. Let's comment out these bits for now. Uh, and that'll do, I think. 
start that up. Now, this is going to be a simple REST API. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Spring Data REST or Spring Data JPA, which is this technology we're using to create those declarative interface-based repositories. What we, need, what we need to know is that I've got a sim simple API that manages entities, entities of a single type called reservation, uh, and that work is already being done for us. It's being done for us automatically, and we can see it reflected here. Uh, what are you doing? Go away. We can see localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. Et voila, right? Hypermedia. Now, these are, this is built by something called Spring Data REST, which in turn has a, is using something called Spring Hati OS, or H-A-T-E-O-S. Hypermedia is the engine of application state. It's a design pattern. It means that every REST resource should have information enough in the response for the client to be able to further manipulate that resource. So basically, we have hypermedia. These links are hypermedia. Uh, Spring Hati OS is built on top of Spring MEC, and it has at its core, at its heart, this object called a resource, a Spring Hot OS resource envelope object. The resource has a payload like this and a collection of links. So keep that in your mind. We're going to use that later on. Now, now then, it's a Spring Boot application. I've got the actuator, of course. I can see, for example, that if I go to metrics, I get information about the uh, available information about the application. I can go to health. I can see information there. You know, all the good stuff is there. But it's just a regular Spring Boot application. And what we're trying to do is to be able to stand up new services quickly. This is a very simple service. And we all know that if you're using Spring Boot, you can go back to the code and open up application.properties in the source main resources directory, and we can make changes. There I can specify things like server, oops, server.port equals 8010, right? If I wanted to run the application and see it spin up on port 8010 instead, that would do it. This is a good approach, but it has one disadvantage, one big disadvantage, which is that it's inside the source main uh, resources directory inside the jar. That is to say, it gets compiled in the jar, and if I want to change anything, I have to recompile the jar to see that change. So here, we can see it worked. It's on port 8010, but it's hardly what, it, what I would want, right? In a real system, I'd want to be able to change this as I promote the build from one environment to another, right? From de development to Q&A to staging, etc. And this is not a new idea, not, not even by a long, long shot, right? There's a 12-factor style configuration. 12-factor style configuration says that configuration that changes from one environment to another should be kept external to the code in the environment. So I'm going to recompile my code here like this. And I'll, I'll have a jar here, a so-called fat jar. And this jar has everything Oops. Everything I need to be able to run the code, it's in that 48 megabyte jar. So I can then take that jar, add it as an attachment, put it in an email, and send it to somebody, and they can run it. Right? So if your operations teams have trouble, again, just talk to somebody who gets attachments and then runs, their, runs the attachment in the email. They can get this working. Um, that said, I'm not quite done. Like, I, I do want to be able to change the configuration. One way to do this is to say java minus d server.port, for example, equals 8030 minus jar reservation service.jar. And here I'm using 12-factor style configuration. I'm overwriting the configuration in the invocation of the Java command line tool. So there we are there, 8030. And I can even use environment variables. I can say export server underscore port equals 8050, for example. So x, x oh, server underscore port. There we are. Java minus jar reservation service dot jar. And now we'll see that get coalesced into server dot port. It'll be fuzzy matched, basically. And that will give us what we want, wanted as well. Again, this is pretty good, but it falls short for a few different reasons. The first is, now that I've got my configuration, I've only done that for one application, right? How am I going to manage that when I have more than one instance of this configuration, or one of this, of this application? Or what if I have more than one service? That's going to become very tedious very quickly. I'm going to have to manage uh, information across all these different services. Not to mention, what if I have a configuration that is consistent or common to all of these services? I don't want to have to duplicate that unnecessarily. One approach might be to use a directory full of configuration files. That might work, but again, that, that relies on me having access to a file system. Uh, and it's uh, a little bit fragile because we may, not, we may not be all running on the same node and, you know, in the cloud environments, that's not a really good option either. It doesn't solve the other problems, though. It doesn't solve the problem, for example, of auditing and journaling. How do I see who changed what and when? And if necessary, to roll that configuration back. For this, I can use Git, perhaps. Maybe my directory is based on Git. That gets me some of the way there, doesn't it? But again, that doesn't solve some of these other more sophisticated problems, like, for example, uh, encryption. 
What if I have sensitive information, passwords, locators, that kind of stuff, in my property files, stored on the file system? Do I want this unencrypted information laying around at rest, unencrypted on the file system? Probably not, right? We, we probably want to do a little bit better job there. So we need something to solve that use case. And then what about changing the configuration live while the service is running? Right? Again, for all these use cases, while what I've shown you is kind of a good start, they wouldn't serve these use cases very well, would they? We'd still have duplicated information in file systems, unencrypted, and we'd have to restart the processes to be able to see configuration. The dash D arguments and the environment variables are good, but they're not great. So to give us a little bit of a, a, little bit of a helping hand here, we're going to go back to start.spring.io, and we're going to build our config server. A config service is just that. It's an API that's going to be, we're going to stand up, and it's going to manage or babysit, if you will, a directory full of configuration, a directory based on Git. So we get those two benefits that we talked about before. But we're going to stand up an API in front of it to handle some of the other things that the uh, Git-based directory doesn't handle for us. So I'm going to go to GitHub here. And this is called Bootiful Microservices Config. It's the directory full of configuration property files that I'm going to use in this example. And again, it could be any valid Git URL. I'm just using one that I've already got laying around here. Uh, and I'm going to keep it on my local file system like this. So there, there it is on my desktop in the config directory. And in the config service, all we're going to do is we're going to turn on the config service. We're going to say, abracadabra, you're a config server. Then we're going to change the configuration. We're going to say that we want the config server to manage uh, the directory full of configuration in the desktop folder, in the config folder. And we're going to run this application on port 8888, like so. OK, whoops. Now, once this is stood up, all of our other microservices, all the microservices that we're going to build are going to talk to the config server. They're going to get their information from the config server first, not from here. So we don't have to worry about uh, how these things talk to each other. We don't have to worry about um, duplicating configuration. Now, suppose I am a microservice, and I'm a microservice of the name reservation-service, which is what we're going to name the service that we've just stood up. How would I see the information uh, that would be visible to that service? How would I see what keys and values are available to that service? I can visit reservation-service, forward slash default, and there I'll see two property sources. The first property source is in the, it represents the keys and values in the property file called reservation-service.properties. The second property source is in application.properties. So these two different property sources are uh, you know, merged together at runtime. They're flattened into a global namespace. We can see here that any microservice that identifies itself as reservation-service would see the keys and values in this property file, but only this property file. Uh, you know, would, this property file would only be available to that service. It wouldn't be available to any other service. All microservices, regardless of their name, will see the configuration values in application.properties. So in this case, reservation-service will try and start up on the environment variable called port, if it's available. Otherwise, the, you know, the port literal value called 8,000. And it'll have access to this message. So let's go ahead and change our reservation service. Let's change the reservation service and have it participate into this centralized configuration uh, by adding the Spring Cloud Starter Config client and then telling our, um, telling our uh, configuration where to find the config server and by what name it should identify itself. So Spring Cloud Config URI equals HTTP localhost 8888. And then spring.application name equals reservation hyphen service. There we are. This is the, the, the configuration that we need to be able to talk to the config server. We're identifying it. We could use an environment variable saying export spring underscore cloud underscore config underscore URI. But this works. And we need to tell the microservice, the reservation service, by what name it identifies itself and it talks to the config service. So we do that here. Now, this information is naturally used earlier on in the initialization of the application itself. It's used to bootstrap the Spring Cloud resolution of the service configuration in the config server. So this is, by convention, located in a property file called bootstrap.properties. Okay? Now, if we've done everything correctly, we should see it spin up on port 8000. That is, after all, what we configured here. And if we set up a controller here, class message risk controller, we should see private final string value, we should see that we can inject the, the config key called message into the controller here, and then take use of it and make use of it. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to parrot that value here. 
at another endpoint. Return this dot value, OK? Uh, and I want to change this value later on. So I'll say at refresh scope. This means that I can recreate this one bean live in situ without having to restart the service. So let's go ahead and see uh, that, if, that, if that's worked. Now, to reestablish what we've done, we've created a config service. The config service is an ideal place to handle things like security. You can lock down the config server. You can lock down the GitHub repository itself, or the Git repository, or GitLab, or whatever. You can add, make it so that the microservice clients, when they talk to the config service, must do mutual authentication based on X509 certificates, for example. So now the communication between the clients and the services can be encrypted and secured. And because the config server sits between the directory of configuration and your microservices, it can do things like decrypt passwords in flight as they get injected into the application. So now, let's see if that works. Let's see if our config server is already at work helping us uh, with our microservice. There's our microservice, but it's now running in port 8000 instead of 8080 or 8010 or whatever we specified before. And there's our message, which is good. It's exactly the message that we are looking for, right? That's the message from here, hello world. But this message isn't great. We can do and should do a better job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the config directory here. I'll open up my little property file, Joe Reservation Service, and I'll say, hello, Spring 1 platform 2016, extra exclamation mark, so as to reinforce my credentials, authority, and authenticity on Reddit. And then I'm going to save this file. So git commit minus a minus m YOLO, OK? Now, my microservice has no idea what's just happened. My config server sees what's happened, of course, but here it has no idea. And that's by design. The last thing we want is for my microservices to constantly pull the downstream service asking for new information. So what we need to do is we need to tell the microservice what's just happened. And we can do this a few ways. We can use an event bus, the Spring Cloud Stream powered event bus. Or we can use another actuator endpoint. And this actuator endpoint lives on each node. So localhost 8000, 8, sorry, 8000. And I'm going to line this up. That's a, that command in curl means send an empty HTTP post to the endpoint called refresh. Uh, on port 8000, which is my microservice. As soon as I hit go, I'm going to hit command tab and then command R as fast as I can. Okay? So I hit go, it came back, I hit command tab, I went to the browser and I hit refresh. I was able to see the updated configuration without restarting the service. This is all because of the power of the refresh scope in Spring Cloud. This gives me the ability to support, for example, feature flags. I can now deploy software that isn't available actively. It's inert, if you will, at production time, in runtime. I can now toggle certain features if I want to. I can do dynamic reconfiguration of things. This makes it very easy to do A-B testing, where I uh, you know, lose a certain feature on a small percentage of the population of my user base, for example. This gives me the ability to do branch by abstraction and continuous delivery pipelines. There's a lot of power in feature flags and this dynamic reconfiguration. And I'll leave it to you to explore further. Now, the next pattern, the next thing that we need to be aware of when we move to a distributed systems world is we need to make it easy for these services to talk to each other. We're going to have more than our simple little service here, certainly. These services are going to be part of a, of a topology of services. These services will talk to each other over the network. And these services, given the nature of a cloud, are going to change where they live. They're going to change the environment. So what we need to do is we want to make it easy for these services to talk to each other in a consistent and safe way. We could, uh, you know, we could um, use a list of host and ports in our code, but that would be very fragile because in a cloud environment, host and ports tend to change. We could decouple that, that binding between the applications and the host and ports for other services by using uh, a service registry, I'm uh, sorry, by using DNS. But DNS is not a really great fit for a lot of reasons in a cloud environment. There are several reasons it's not a great fit. The first reason. The first reason is that DNS is itself routable by a DNS. A service that is exposed and available through DNS is by definition routable through DNS, which you may not always want. Right? Sometimes I want my services to be dark, to be just kind of hanging off on the side there, inaccessible to anybody uh, except for you know, by direct connection. Another problem with DNS is that it's a pretty dumb protocol. It doesn't have the ability to answer interesting, very basic questions. If I make a request to a service, exposed or mapped to DNS, I don't want to sit there waiting for a reply that may not come. I want to be able to ask the question, is that service there? And if it's there, am I going to get a reply? And if it's not there, then I want to do something else. right? I can't afford to block. In most organizations, uh, being offline for however long your default timeout 
uh, in, your, in your application server is, is a bad idea. Quick pop quiz. How many of you know the default timeout for the Java, Java net URL connection? Yeah, different values over different times, but the point is you don't want to find out, right? So unless you know of all the places and all of the code where the URL, connect, URL net connection is being used, and you've made sure to specify a timeout that's very aggressive so you don't just stop and block forever, unless you've done that for every bit of code in your code base, you should really reconsider making calls to services that may not be there. Another problem with DNS is not DNS uh, itself. It's, it's that DNS requires uh, resolution. It requires resolution because it's a service. You have to call the DNS service to get the resolved uh, you know, information for that, for that service, which adds cost. It adds latency to your calls. It may not be such a big deal if you're doing caching, which you should. But if you're doing caching, now you have stale entries in the, uh, in the, in the, pool, of the pool of available services. So that's a problem, right? You may have stale entries. You may call a service that doesn't exist. Another problem with DNS is, 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 again, not DNS itself. It's DNS load balancers. DNS load balancers aren't actually able to do good load balancing. All they can load balance is the first connections to the load balancer. So if I make a call to a load balancer, if I have a load balancer and I make 10 requests, maybe two of those requests will take five minutes, but the other two will, you know, or the other nine will take two seconds. If those two that take two, 10, uh, 10 minutes all land on the same node, for example, uh, I'm going to overwhelm that, that node. I'm not effectively load balancing. So DNS load balancers don't know about the nature of the work that you're trying to do. They can't do a good job load balancing because they don't actually know the nature of the work. All they know is how many connections have arrived and how many nodes are in the pool. Another problem with DNS uh, load balancers is not so much the load balancers themselves, but the languages that use them, like Java. Right? Java, very sensibly, for 20 years ago, caches resolved DNS entries. So the JDK, when you use the JDK to make a, a network request, it caches the resolved whole, uh, IP for that DNS entry. And it reuses it, which is smart. In a world where applets roam the Earth, and every service is fairly, fairly static, that makes a lot of sense. But in a dynamic cloud environment where services come and go as they need to, based on a capacity and availability and demand, that's a really bad thing, right? It means that you've defeated the load balancer. You're going to overwhelm that one service, this first service to which you've been uh, assigned. So you don't really get what you're looking for here. So we can get around a lot of this. But we can get around these problems by using a service registry. A service registry gives us the effect of a load balancer. It's a logical mapping from service ID to hosts and ports. And we can go back to start.spring.io. And we can build an application. Uh, we can build our own service registry. We can use Netflix's Eureka. Now, Spring Cloud has an abstraction. It's called the Discovery Client abstraction. The Discovery Client abstraction makes it easy for us to uh, talk to all manner of different service registries. And this is important because for all of the benefits of the Discovery Client abstraction in Spring Cloud, the one negative to service registration and discovery is that it's invasive. Your code has to be aware of it. So if it's, going to be, if it's going to be aware of it as compared to, for example, DNS, then we want it to be as minimally so as possible. And so the Spring Cloud abstraction gives us that. Uh, we can use the Discovery Client abstraction to talk to, for example, uh, Netflix Eureka. We can talk to Apache Zookeeper or HashiCorp Console or even Cloud Foundry itself. I'm going to use Netflix Eureka, though, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's super simple to set up, which is nice. Uh, and then second of all, it's been used at scale by one of the largest websites on the planet. So we know it works. We know it scales. It's, it's got that going for us. So I'm going to say Eureka Service, Eureka Server, Config Client, and uh, there we go. Now this is going to be a service that we're going to configure using the Config Service. That's why I've brought in the Config Client. And we're going to do the same normal pro forma kind of stuff. We'll say spring.application name equals uh, Eureka hyphen service. And we're going to give it a, a pointer to the uh, directory for, uh, sorry, the Config Service itself. Here we are. Okay, and I'm going to rename this property file to be, uh, you know, um, bootstrapped up properties. Okay, and we'll say Eureka Service Application at enable Eureka Server. Voila, and you can see all I've got in my build here is Spring Cloud Starter Eureka Server. So we'll start this up, and if everything goes to plan, we should see it in port eight seven six one. OK, good stuff. 8761. 
Now, there's our simple Eureka registry. There's a few things I want you to note about this newly stood up registry. First of all, really well done ASCII animated GIF, I mean. Very well done. We have people for that. Uh, and also, no registered instances of the application. Not yet, anyway. So we need to teach our reservation service to raise its hand to say, listen, if anybody needs me, I'm right here. This is my host. This is my port. You can find me here. And we, we've already got most of what we need to do that. We've got the Spring Cloud Discovery Client Abstraction Implementation for Eureka right here on the class path. So let's go ahead and add that in. We'll say at enable discovery client. And then we'll go ahead and restart. Now, once that's done, it's going to spin up, and it's going to raise its hand. It's going to call the, the registry uh, for us, and it's going to register itself as being available in that service. And then now we can build a client that we can use to talk to that service uh, quickly and easily. This does not bode well for us. Well. We try for a live version. Oh, whew. that was terrifying. Um, let's see. What we're going to do is we're going to build a client, a very simple client. It's going to be a client that will talk to the downstream reservation service. Uh, we're going to use Fane for declarative REST clients. We're going to use the config client. We'll use Eureka discovery client support. We're going to use RabbitMQ for stream processing, Zipkin for distributed tracing, Histrix for circuit breakers, Zool for microproxy uh, implementation. We're going to use OAuth for security. Uh, and we'll use um, REST repositories. So we'll use hypermedia support and web support, and perhaps actuator because YOLO. Okay. Now we're going to hit generate. And this client, you know, we have to do the same normal kind of proformer sort of stuff. We need to point it to the config server. So we'll open up application properties here. We'll say spring cloud dot config dot uri equals http localhost eighty eight eighty eight, and we're going to say spring dot application name equals reservation hyphen client. Now, again, we're not going to build just any client here. This is going to be a special kind of client. It's going to be a client that will live at the logical edge of our architecture, will live at the edge of the system, at the edge of the cloud, responding to requests from actual clients, clients like my iPhone, like my PlayStation, like my Roku, my Android, my iOS device, my HTML5 client, etc. These different clients are myriad, right? We know, well, I'm sure we all know today uh, several different devices that we use to engage with services you know, out of our control. We have watches, we have cars, we have microwaves. In the Internet of Things, pretty much everything has a client and an IP now. And so what we want to be able to, be able to handle is how do we talk to those different services in a consistent way? Um, and of course, the problem is that these different clients have specialized concerns, security, uh, authentication, authorization, et cetera, protocols and payloads, all these kinds of things that are different to each client. This means that we have a very large problem to solve because for every client we add, we'd have to change every microservice if we want to be able to talk to it. We need to be able to speak the right protocol, the same, uh, you know, use the right security mechanism, et cetera. So rather than retrofitting every single microservice to accommodate every new client, of which, of course, there will be myriad, it's easier to stand up an edge service a service uh, that is client specific. You have an HTML5 edge service, you'll have an Android edge service, you'll have a, you know, a, a iOS edge service, etc., etc., etc. Think about HTML5. HTML5 browsers today are insanely, ridiculously, unnaturally powerful. They can do all sorts of cool stuff. How many of you have seen JS Linux? I've talked about this before at a few different spring ones. I think this is just ridiculous. This is a JavaScript HTML5 implementation of a Linux emulator. That JavaScript, entirely in the browser, booted a Linux kernel. And now I'm running a Linux kernel in the browser in a TTYS device that's mapped to Chrome, if you will. And I'm going to open up vi hello.c, and I'll say print, and I'll use you know, escape i, hello spring one platform 2016. But you didn't think you'd see live coding C inside of a browser at this conference, huh? So there we go. And now, tcc minus o hello.c, hello. And uh, there we are. I've just compiled C inside of HTML5, inside of JavaScript, inside of a Linux that I booted inside of HTML5, and then ran it. So there's that. You can say you saw that at the show. My point is, the HTML5 browser today is really, really powerful. Right? 
You don't need to hold its hand. You don't need to babysit it. It's, it's fine, right? You can do all sorts of good stuff with it. The one limitation is that it lives in a secure sandbox. That secure sandbox means that if you want to call other services that live on different hosts and ports, you're going to run into trouble. You can add a policy to each uh, microservice, a, a cross-origin request scripting uh, policy, if you want, that exempts cross-origin requests. But that would mean, necessarily, retrofitting every single microservice, which we specifically want to avoid. One way to get around that is to use a micro-proxy. Right? Uh, and that's what we're going to do. We've gonna, we're going to use Netflix's Zool micro-proxy. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and comment out a few bits here before we get started. This is the Zool micro-proxy right here. And all we need to do is to say, at enable Zool proxy. What's wrong with this? Oh, thank you, my mob programmer. See, pair programming works. Good stuff. Now, let's go ahead and restart this. Now, when we have that Zool micro proxy, what it, what it does is it's, a, it's a, a reverse proxy, right? It's based on, it's named, of course, for Zool. Now, I'm sure you've all kept abreast of your Greek and Ghostbusters mythology, and you know that this is Zool in Ghostbusters. This is the gatekeeper to the underworld, the proxy to the underworld. Or at least that's what's implied in the movie, but I'm not actually sure because it's been a long time since I've seen the movie. Uh, and my friend said to me, you know, Josh, that's not really fair. We don't know that about him. It's not fair to judge. He could come from a very nice place. He could come from Hawaii. Who knows? Anyway, the point is, that's Zool, and, and he's the proxy uh, to the underworld. And so Zool sets up routes for us. We can set up routes to say, for example, that localhost 9999 forward slash foo should go map to Google. But Spring Cloud, by convention and by default, sets up routes for us automatically based on the registered services in the service registry. So let's see that in action. I can go here to localhost 9999 reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. And you can see that when I go to the edge service and make a request to the service ID as part of the context path forward slash reservations, I get the JSON from the actual service, right? This is the actual service on port 8000. That's the edge service. Edge, actual, edge, actual, edge, actual, edge, actual, right? I'm proxying back and forth between the edge service and the downstream service using super efficient, super fast, reactive asynchronous I.O., right? So now my HTML5 client can talk to all of my downstream services. It has no idea uh, that that data is that output is coming from a downstream service that isn't on the same host and port, and it doesn't care. In fact, when the proxy makes a request, it sends in the, uh, in the headers, it, says, it sends an origin URL, which the downstream service is using here, to rewrite the URL that's being sent back. Now, of course, um, one thing that you may be wondering is, how does it know which service to call? How does it know which instance? Remember what we talked about earlier. I've got one instance of that reservation service in the registry already. I've got it registered in Eureka. But what if I, uh, you know, what if I have more than one? How does it pick the right instance? It does this by doing something called client-side load balancing. Client-side load balancing lets us make the decision about which node to, which to route the request on the client using, a log, you know, using Java code. We can, it uses something called Netflix Ribbon. Ribbon is a client-side load balancer that has different implementations of load balancing strategies. The default load balancer, of course, is round robin. Right? It'll do round robin load balancing across all of the registered instances in the service registry. So when, when this Zool micro proxy gets called, it calls the registry, it calls Zookeeper or Console or Eureka or whatever, and it gets back all of the server instances, the host and ports uh, for the registered service, and it picks from among, among them. It says e mini mani moan, and then it, it picks one, and it gets back a result. It makes, that, it makes that decision entirely in Java code on the client. And you can override the strategy that it uses to do that because it's just Java. You can version control it. You can unit test it. If you want to do more interesting kinds of load balancing, maybe you want to do data center aware load balancing, or you want to do multi-tenancy data sharding kind of load balancing, or maybe you're like, you, want to, you have a, a JSON web token based OAuth client, which is completely stateless, calling into the load balancer, and you want to pin that request to a node that is doing something long running. Maybe you're streaming video, which is something you don't easily load balance randomly, right? Maybe you want to make sure that the request always goes to the same node because you're streaming the video from there. Whatever it is, you can handle that logic in the client-side load balancer. And it gets, it's easy to do. Now you've got control over the nature of the load balancing. You can do that logic because you're now aware of the requests and the workloads themselves. OK, so maybe this is enough. I mean, this might be 
you know, a common use case. It might be good enough. Uh, but oftentimes, it's useful to, it's oftentimes uh, um, important to do just a bit more than blindly proxying data back and forth. Maybe I want to, maybe I want to uh, instead of just blindly getting, making a request and getting the reply, maybe I want to enrich the request or the reply. Maybe I want to do something different than just blindly proxying it. In this case, I'm going to stand up a separate kind of edge service or a different kind of edge service. Instead of a microproxy, where I blindly send data back and forth, I'm going to create what's called an API gateway. I'm going to simply call the downstream service and do some sort of enrichment or transformation or filtering or whatever, and then return the data, or maybe transform the request. In my case, what I want to do is just call the downstream reservation service and return only the name. So Josh and Jurgen and Andrew and Bridget and all these people, all these wonderful people, I'm going to return all of them just the names, though. I'm going to throw away the Spring Data REST, Spring Hot OS based resource envelope object, strip away all the surrounding J JSON strata, and just keep the names. And I could use the REST template here, right? Uh, so I'm going to create a simple Spring MVC API gateway. I'll say class reservation API gateway. And uh, I'll make this a REST controller, and I'll root it at request mapping forward slash reservations. And I'm going to create an endpoint that just says public collection of strings names. And I'll root this at request mapping. Method equals git. Value equals names. And there we go. So I could do that. I could say, when, you know, whenever somebody calls localhost 9999 reservations names, they should call this endpoint, and we'll get the data back. And one way to make that call is to you know, inject the uh, uh, REST template here using a constructor, and then to tell Spring Cloud to, to inject a load balanced one like this. You can say at load balanced. And you define the bean up here. And this makes the REST template um, aware of the Eureka registry. And it'll automatically do client side load balancing for us. I could do this. I could say load balanced. But this is a lot of code. And what I want to do is I want to quickly handle the work of calling a downstream service without having to worry too much about low level REST. So I'm going to use instead Fain. Fain is a way of doing declarative REST clients. It comes from Netflix. Fain in English, of course, means to pretend. Like if you see an animal in the forest that is playing dead, you can say it's feigning dead, right? So I'm going to say at enable feign clients. And I can declaratively define a client like this. I can say reservation reader. And I can say when I call the downstream hypermedia hyper JSON API, I'm going to get the JSON back. I'm going to have feign turn it into a collection of resource object objects whose payload is of type reservation, like this. Now, one, one question, of course, that you may be wondering is, if, is obviously, where do I get that reservation type, right? Where does that reservation type exist? I could obviously copy the type from the service implementation itself, but that would unnecessarily couple my client to the type and you know, the implementation on the service side. So I'm going to create a client side representation here called reservation. And I'm just going to have a, a DTO, if you will, a, a mapping object that I can map my uh, HTTP request to. So Fane is going to look at the signature of the request mapping annotation here. And it's going to say, OK, you want me to call the reservation service. And you want me to make an HTTP GET request whenever somebody calls this read method. And you want me to call the reservation's endpoint. And of course, it's aware of, this, it's aware of the uh, registry. So it'll do the right thing. It'll load balance across all of the registered instances for us. We get that for free. All that is done for us. We could use the REST template. Again, this is just a little bit more high level, a little bit more uh, powerful. So let's try that again, OK? We'll say private final reservation reader. We'll create a constructor and inject that there. And now I'll say return this dot reservation reader dot read dot get content dot stream dot map r of r of reservation name, and then collect that out into a collection like this. OK? And of course, I could use a lambda. So that's fine. This is a, a very, very simple uh, API gateway. Let's go ahead and see what happens. All I'm doing is I'm calling the downstream service. I'm mar mapping through every record. Whoa. Hello, computer. I'm mapping through every record and um, stripping away the surrounding strata, the, the JSON. Oops. Did I forget to plug in Eureka? Oh, 
Oh, thank you. Ah, rat. Thank you. So there we go. We'll try again, this time with more gusto and the correct names. So this should do the right thing in the common case of, you know, I'm calling a downstream service and I have one or more instances of that service available. Hello. Oh, sorry. Reservations. Now what? Oh, son of a gun. Names here. That's correct. Read reservations. Reservation service. I'm not sure what you mean, my friend. This is the edge service. Here's the reservation service. That's got data. Here's the edge service, reservation names. That should map to reservation names. I'm using reservation reader, which is uh, this guy here, which is going to load balance a call to the reservation service. Call the reservations. Fain client. Sorry? Well, this is the edge service, right? This should be on port 99.99. Okay, Spring Cloud Starter, Eureka, Fane, Zipkin, RabbitMQ, Hypermedia. But it, it shouldn't. <laughs> Certainly never done it before. Good point. You want me to restart, you say? Oh, I forgot to have the right type. So it's trying to marshal from the Hypermedia API, but I didn't have the right type on the class path. So of course, it failed because it can't marshal. Uh, we could use a failure anal analyzer there. So anyway, now I've got the simple API gateway. Thanks for all your help. Uh, and you can see this is going to work at what? Sorry? Huh? How did you come to the conclusion? Yeah, I, I had a guess in this case. I, I could have analyzed the class path, but I don't have time to set the debug and go through it. I had a guess that that might be it. So in this case, it does the right thing in the 80% case. If I have one or more instances of that registered service, it's going to correctly load balance across them, and we're going to get what we want. But this is going to fall short in a system, in a scenario where we have uh, zero downstream services. And we can't afford that. Remember, there are four key tenets to a cloud native system. The first, of course, is that it'd be easy to evolve, it's agile. The second is that it takes, a, takes advantage of the elasticity of a cloud environment. The third is that it should do the right thing in the face of failure. And we've failed to address that use case here. We've failed to acknowledge the reality of the situation, which is that failures will happen. High-performing organizations understand this fact implicitly. They understand that in a high-performing system uh, with enough sufficient distribu distribution, failures will happen, and we cannot afford to ignore those. Right? So in this case, we need to be a little bit more graceful. We need to degrade gracefully if something should go wrong. I want to make sure that there's a fallback method that gets invoked if anybody should call this service and there's no service you know, to call. If I call the reservation reader and it tries to load balance across zero registered services, it's going to throw an exception. So I want to make sure that if that happens, we, we call a fallback method. I'll say public collection of string fallback. And I'm just going to return an empty array list. Right? High performing websites do this sort of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, you called the search engine service, but the search engine isn't available right now. So here instead is a, uh, is a here are some machine learned recommendations from across the web. Is it, is it what you wanted exactly? Probably not, but it's certainly better than nothing, right? It's better than the big shruggy or the big stack trace in the browser. We wanna, we're going to use something here called a circuit breaker. The circuit breaker, like, a, like the same component in the building, in a building, is, uh, is going to sit there, and whenever there's a risk of an overwhelming amount of, of traffic, it's going to open. And it's going to prevent further conduction of traffic through that circuit. It's going to protect our downstream service. And all we need to do to enable it is to say, at enable circuit breaker. Now, of course, in our code, we have uh, Spring Cloud Starter 
Histrix. Histrix is the circuit breaker implementation that we're using. Here it is, Histrix. So let's go ahead and see this in action. Now I'm going if to, I, if I, when the service comes up, I can make a call to it and I can see the results. Then I can go to the downstream service and kill it and I'll see the same thing. I want to guarantee at all times that things are going to work even if the f service fails. An another way to make that guarantee, another question that we may run into is, how do I make that guarantee when we're doing writes? So of course, here's the read, right? Here's the read. Um, now I go back to my reservation service and I kill this and I make the call and it, it times out. It times out and it tries to call the downstream service, but you can see it's stuttering. It's going to hesitate there a little bit. It's stuttering and it's trying to call the downstream service, but it's not working. That's eventually going to time out enough times that it's going to open the circuit. It's going to protect our downstream service and it's going to give it time to recover. If you have something like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will make sure that, you know, uh, if you want 10 instances of that service, at all, available at all times, it'll start up and make sure that you have 10 instances running at all times. It'll move heaven and earth to make sure that that's true. And it'll restart things as they fall down. But it's our job as developers to make sure that we build software that does the right thing in, these, in the face of these ineluctable sort of uh, topology changes, which is what we're doing here. We're making sure that even if there are no instances, we do something better than just blowing up and throwing an exception. This is graceful degradation. Now, if I restart the service, we'll see that it'll heal itself eventually and you'll be able to call this endpoint again. Now, this is good for reading, but what about writes? What if I'm, signed, what if I'm trying to send data to the downstream service uh, and the downstream service isn't available? How do I circuit break a write? It's not really as easy as that, is it? If the downstream service is there, you've got to guarantee that data gets eventually delivered somehow. We can't make a post because the service isn't, isn't there. So we're going to use, uh, we can use any of a number of different patterns, right? There's a number of different approaches for this. The worst approach, by far, provably, is to use distributed transactions. If you feel the need to, to use distributed transactions, I urge you to reconsider your terrible life choices. <laughs> to stop, go home, hug your family, pet the dog or cat, drink, do whatever it makes it easier for you to try again. Come back the next day and then revisit that decision. And there are lots of great alternatives. There's a 30-year-old alternative called the Saga Pattern. The Saga pattern describes long-running processes in a single node. But what is a network partition but time? It's a long-running thing, right? It's, that's what we're dealing with here. So the Saga pattern works just as well for distributed systems. The idea is that if you can model your system in terms of uh, interleavable, that is to say reorderable transactions, each of which has a, that, uh, for, and, uh, you know, and uh, a set of interleavable transactions that has each one of them a compensatory transaction, that may be replayed as many times as necessary. If you can model your system like that, then you can use the Saga pattern to guarantee consistency across a distributed system given a little bit of time. You might, for example, uh, see the orbits.com use case or the kayak.com use case. You have a car, you, have, uh, you want to book a car, you want to book a hotel, you want to book a flight. I can call all three of these different web services, but I want to make sure that if one of them fails, all three of them fail, and I roll them all back. Here, I can use a compensatory transaction. I can reset, reset the system to a semantically consistent state. I can cancel the bookings for the car, the flight, and the hotel. Right? This is a great approach, and it's certainly something I'd recommend you take a look at. Uh, in our case, we can get away with even less. We can just use eventual consistency. We can make the write and then deliver it to the downstream service using messaging. Right? I've got RabbitMQ running on my local machine. RabbitMQ is a messaging system. And I can use Spring Integration. Spring Integration is a framework for building event-driven systems. I can use Spring Integration uh, very nicely here to solve the problem. Spring Integration has at its heart the Spring Framework message channel. A message channel is like a queue. You can push data in and pop data out, and you can connect different channels together based on these components, these components that can handle all sorts of cool stuff. They can, do, uh, they can adapt data from different systems and transform them, split them, aggregate them, uh, you know, uh, enrich them, filter them, et cetera. They, they basically, it's a framework for building uh, systems in line with Gregor Hope and Bobby Wolf's amazing book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Integration. Spring integration is meant to handle integration with all manner of different systems, be it you know, file systems and FTP servers and XMPP and MQTT and uh, RabbitMQ and Apache Kafka and all these different things you know, that, that, can, that could in some way produce events. But we're not going to be using an FTP server, are we? Not for this. We're not going to connect our microservices using an FTP broker. There's no point. 
we can, we can certainly take for granted that in 2016, we're probably going to use a message broker, right? Something like Apache Kafka or something like RabbitMQ. So if we're willing to make this uh, assumption, if we're willing to take that for granted, we can move up the abstraction stack a little bit and get some of the benefits by moving to some, something like Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream lets us work in the same event-driven model, and it has at its heart the concept of channels. But the work of configuring these channels is declarative. It's done for us by the machine, by the runtime. So we're going to declaratively define channel definitions in interfaces. And then as a matter of configuration and convention, configuration, by the way, that lives external to the code, we'll see these systems get com connected together at runtime. So let's talk about that. Let's say I go back to the reservation client here. Oh, and by the way, in the interim, I restarted the service, and now that's healed itself. So it did the right thing. Now, let's go back to the reservation service, or rather the client. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that I've got Spring Cloud st Starter Stream Rabbit on the class path, and it seems I do, so there's that. And I'm going to use Spring Cloud Stream Rabbit because that's, what the machine, that's the implementation I've got on my machine. But there are other implementations, as I say. There's Kafka, for example. Uh, in in um, Spring Cloud Stream 1.1, there's also JMS. You can use Redis right now. Uh, and there's RabbitMQ and so on. So these are all very, very good choices. Uh, and the point is we don't have to worry too much about the underlying broker. We can just worry about writing code that works with channels. So I will do so declaratively. I'll say interface reservation channels. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to create an interface that Spring Cloud Stream will implement for us. I'm going to create a single message channel. but there's no reason you couldn't create multiple message channels, right? I could have one for orders or customers, another one for products, you know, whatever. All these different downstream services, you could create channel definitions for them in the same interface. Uh, and then I'm going to tell Spring Cloud Stream to create the binding for us based on that channel definition. So I'll say reservationchannels.class, and I'll say output, and there we go. So now Spring Cloud Stream is going to see that name, the output channel, and it's going to create that channel. It's going to connect it to the broker because it knows where that broker is by looking at the configuration. And now I can create a new edge service. I can create an edge service that does a post. So public void write. And in my, in my uh, post, I'm going to expect a JSON structure that I can coerce into a, into a type of reservation. And in that JSON structure, I want to send the data to the downstream service. Now, again, here again, I could do things a low level Level, low level way. I could say, let's use a channel, and then I could inject the um, reservation channels here uh, like this, and then tell Spring Cloud, tell this controller to get its channel and then send the data into the message channel uh, explicitly. But I don't need to. I can use Spring Integration. Right? I can use Spring Integration messaging gateways to declaratively define my interface uh, between this um, messaging-based code and my downstream messaging-based code. So I'll say interface reservation writer void write. So I'm getting the same effect, if you will, uh, as the uh, declarative Fane-based uh, REST client. But because we're not using REST, Fane doesn't work here. right? It's not, not appropriate. But we can get the same effect by using messaging gateways from Spring Innovation. So here I'm going to say that the request channel is output. Whenever somebody injects this type, they're going to get a method called void write that will take a payload. And it's going to send that payload on the output channel, which is the channel that we've defined here. So I need to turn on that feature. I'll say integration component scan. OK, add that up here to the very top. Doesn't matter. Just you know, order. And now I can inject that writer instead. I'll say private final reservation writer. OK, and I will add this as a constructor parameter. Voila. And I don't need this. Don't need that. Now I can make short work of doing this. I can say reservation writer dot write reservation dot get reservation name. And that's going to send the data in the output channel, and it's going to connect to the downstream service. So this is the client. Let's go ahead and restart the uh, service itself here. Now the service, we need to do the same thing in reverse, don't we? Whenever a, a message arrives, we want to take delivery of the message, if possible, if we're available, and then write it to the database. And we're going to use the repository to do that. Right? We're going to use the same repository that we had before here. So I'm going to go ahead and create a messaging endpoint here. I'm going to say, whoops, I'll say, Message endpoint. Oops, I got to bring back those dependencies, don't I? So let's bring back these two bits here. OK, and I'll say at message endpoint.
class reservation processor. Okay. Message endpoint. Public void write, or basically on new reservation. That's what I'm telling Spring Innovation. I'm telling Spring Innovation that I want to listen for any incoming messages that are coming in, or I can even just say, give me the payload, any new reservation names, which is after all what we're going to send in the channel. And whenever that channel, whenever that message comes on the input channel called input, which we're going to define in a minute, let's go ahead and write the data to the repository that we've injected here, right? So this dot reservation repository dot save equals new reservation, reservation name, etc. And there we are. There's my simple messaging endpoint. And we're going to do the same thing in reverse. We have to create another binding here. We'll say at enable binding. And we need to create another channel. But this time we're going to take data in on the input channels. So I'll create another input, I'll create an input uh, subscribable channel, right, as usual. And I'll tell Spring Cloud Stream to hide that, hydrate that definition for me and make it available so I can consume it. So now if I restart this, we should now see that I'm able to send data from the, from the client and have it arrive uh, here at the service, which is what we want, right? So that'll come to life. OK. So this should fail. Yep. That's, it has to re, uh, do the heartbeat check with the uh, registry and get the uh, updated list. But in the meantime, we can still um, make posts, right? So we're going to say curl minus D. Sorry. Curl minus D, curly bracket. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Curly, OK. Reservation name. And I'm going to send a few of my favorite doctors, right? So the actual downstream service, localhost, 8,000 forward slash reservations. You can see I've got Jurgen and Cornelia and Stefan and all these cool people, um, except for me, of course. And then uh, I'm going to send some of my favorite doctors into the mix. So we'll send the good uh, Doctor Who, OK? H content type application JSON, HTTP, localhost, 9999, reservations. Now, here's the edge service. There's that. So let's go ahead and send. Oops, did I do it wrong? Sorry? OK. Shouldn't even need to do that, actually. Et voila. So there's Doctor Who, right? One of my first doctors. So that I'm successfully posting to the edge service and having it being delivered to the downstream service, which is then writing it to the database. And that means that uh, if the downstream service is there, it's going to work just fine. Now, I want to make sure that it does the right thing even if, it's, if, even if it's not there. One thing that we need to understand before we look at the configuration that's making this work is that Spring Cloud Stream bindings are uh, multicast. They're published, subscribed. They're one to many. So if I have one producer that sends a message to a broker, that broker is going to deliver that message to as many consumers as are listening. So what we want are Spring Cloud Stream bindings that are direct, point to point, one to one. So let's look at the configuration now to see how that works. Localhost 8888 reservation hyphen client forward slash default. What you can see here is that we have Spring Cloud Stream Bindings output, and this is the channel name. This is the message channel as we defined it in the interface on the client. And then reservations. This is the agreed upon rendezvous point between the producer and the consumer. This, is, this corresponds to a queue or a topic in our broker. It's the agreed upon channel and exchange in the broker in this case. So we see that on the producer side. And we see the same thing here on the consumer side. It says, Spring Cloud Stream Bindings input destination equals reservations, but then we have two other bits, and this is where the uh, the one to one, you know, communication comes into play. What we want is we want to make sure that all of the consumers are part of an exclusive consumer group. So here we've got a group that says that if we have ten consumers in the same group, then only one in, one one consumer in that group will get the message. So I've got 
I've got as many clients as I want. I can stand up 100 of them to load balance if I need to. But only one in the group called reservations group will get any one message. So you're, now, you're not duplicating the messages now. Now you're load balancing instead. You can scale out by adding more capacity. And to make sure that I can handle uh, a message that's been delivered while the services are down, I've made sure that my input channel is durable, the subscription is durable, so that they're going to be re-delivered when the service comes back to life if it's down. So let's go ahead and see that in action. Now I'm going to go back to my reservation service, oops, here, and I will kill it. Oops, there we are. And now I'm going to send some more of my favorite doctors. We'll send. Dr. Sire, who is the uh, co-founder of Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Spring Cloud Security and Spring, um, you know, uh, Spring, he founded Spring Batch and is a Spring Framework committer. We'll send uh, Dr. Pollock, who is a founder of Spring.net. He's a Spring Framework committer, co-founder of Spring AMQP, Spring uh, Cloud Dataflow, and Spring XD. Uh, and uh, we'll also send Dr. Subramaniam, who is just boss sauce. Okay, there we are, Subramaniam. Now, I'm going to restart the service, and what we should see is that when we restart the service, the command line runner here, in which we've added eight records to the, uh, to the database, will get executed after we've taken delivery of the three new doctors. So we should see the three good doctors, then eight records on the console here. OK. There we are. Doctors Sire, Pollock, and Subramaniam, then the command line runner. And we can see that here. Uh, there's Dr. Sire, Pollock, etc. So the data arrived as the service restarted. And we're able to write it to the database. We're able to guarantee that even though the service was down when we called the, when we called the service, the messages got delivered eventually. Using messaging, we've made sure that we have a resilient system for both uh, for writes. If the system is down, we can do the right thing for writes. And if we use um, the circuit breaker, we, do the, we make sure it does the right thing when we're doing reads. Now we've built a system that is resilient to failure for both cases. Now, of course, I'm all about observability. I'm a big believer that you need to be able to see what's happening in the system. And if you know about Spring Boot's actuator, then you know that actuator gives you visibility on a host by host and a node by node basis of what's happening in the system. But it doesn't give you the whole picture. It doesn't give you the systemic view of the system. This, you see, when you walk around in Las Vegas, is that the same thing as looking at a Google map of Las Vegas? Of course not, right? It's, there's, it's far more vivid, not to mention hotter, right? There's so much more to see, so much more to do, so much more livelihood, more ac you know, action, right? If you're walking around in the city, that's very different from looking at a picture of the map of the city. The, the map is not the terrain. And the same is true for our system. Our production system has emergent behavior, behavior that we cannot hope to capture by looking at the architecture diagram, behavior that we need to, to be able to observe as it's happening. To do this, we need good monitoring in the system itself, not just on a host-by-host -host and a node-by-node -node basis. So one way to get that, that observability, to get that systemic view, is to look at those circuit breakers. Think about it. That circuit breaker is a connective tissue. It's a connection between our clients and our downstream services. So that, that circuit breaker represents a connective line between one node and another. And it's great for services over which we have control and, over, and the ability to exercise governance, but it's much better for services over which uh, we have no control, other people's APIs, other people's services. So the circuit breaker uh, is something where I want to have monitoring and visibility, right? We go to start.spring.io, and now we can say that we want to build a Hystrix dashboard to be able to monitor the flow of data through that circuit breaker. So this session goes until um, 15. Uh, 50, by the way. Okay. So config client, Eureka Discovery, and the Hystrix dashboard. We'll hit go, open this up. Hystrix dashboard application, at enable Hystrix dashboard, at enable discovery client. We're going to do the same sort of normal stuff. We're going to point it to the config service. We'll say localhost. 8888 spring.application name equals Hystrix dashboard. Okay. I'm going to rename this file to be bootstrapped up properties as usual. Okay, let's start that up. Now what this is going to do is it's going to give us a dialogue, a little a little dashboard in which we can put um, 
a service end event heartbeat stream. Hello. There we go. This heartbeat, heartbeat stream comes off the edge service. The edge service is, after all, where we have the connection between the client and the downstream service. And that circuit may fail. So I want to be able to see what's happening in that circuit breaker. This heartbeat stream is never ending. It's infinite. It goes on and on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever. So whatever you do, whatever you do, do not curl this endpoint. <laughs> We're going to take that heartbeat stream and paste it into our dashboard here, 8010 histrix.html, paste, hit monitor. And there, I can draw traffic on the left, and I can see on the right the moving average is trending ever upwards. I can see 13, 17, 23, 29, et cetera. So we now have the ability to very easily see the flow of data through that circuit. If the downstream service isn't available, we'll see the circuit breaker open up, and we'll get the fallback. And then the circuit will say, open instead of closed. It'll turn red. And we'll see that instead of having 0% failures, we'll have 100% failures or some percentage of the you know, uh, non-performant traffic. So this is very, very useful. Now, of course, if I have more than one uh, circuit in my system, I'm going to want to be able to see all of the circuit breakers in a single place. And for this, we can use Spring Cloud Turbine. Spring Cloud Turbine makes it easy for us to multiplex our requests into a, a single dashboard, right? So I can say, I can use, um, I can get a view that looks like this. Right? Lots of circuits in one, one screen, and that's very easy to do now. We'll leave that as an exercise for you now. Another place, another way to get systemic visibility and observability is to use distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is very important. You see, what we want to do is we want to be able to flow, follow the flow of messages from one service to another. And there are many different ways to do this. Uh, but, and in theory, it's very simple, but it's actually a lot of work. In theory, what we're trying to do is to say, whenever a request is made at a service, we want to take that message, that request, add a unique ID, some sort of correlation ID, and then propagate that request to downstream, to propagate that request along with that unique ID to all downstream services. And then use that unique ID to correlate the flow of this request through the system. Right? So uh, we can do this very, very simply. We can, uh, in theory, it sounds very simple, but it's actually quite a bit of work to do this correctly. We want to make sure that if we do this, uh, that we don't have to change all of the code in all the places where messages enter or exit the system, all the ingress and egress points in the application. So for this, I, we have something called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Sleuth. Sleuth is a distributed tracing abstraction. It is part of Spring Cloud, and it's already built in. And you've already got it on the I've already got it on the class path here, and we can already see that it's doing work for us. So if I go, for example, to the reservation client, I can see the service ID, the service, uh, the sorry, the trace ID, and then the span ID. The trace ID is the unique ID that we give to all the whole message, the whole flow of the message from A to Z, from the very beginning to the very end. Um, the span here is the unique ID that we give to each hop in that journey, from A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, E to F, etc., etc., etc. This is a this is very very powerful. It's very very useful because now I can see by looking at the logs the flow of messages. I can do you know log archaeology to see the flow of data in the system. Now naturally this is. Uh, a good start, but I'm a big believer that a picture is worth a thousand uh, spans. So we're going to use Zipkin. Zipkin is a distributed tracing platform uh, originated at Twitter. So I'm going to say Zipkin uh, UI, Zipkin server, config client Eureka. I'm going to hit generate. Hit go. Now, Zipkin service application, and I'll say at enable Zipkin server. At enable discovery client application properties spring dot cloud dot config dot uri http localhost eighty eight eighty eight spring dot application name equals zipkin hyphen service. So again, we're just going to point this to the config server, do the normal sort of pro forma stuff, bootstrap dot properties, and Whoops, there we go. Now we'll start this up. And this is going to sit on the side, responding. Uh, it's going to have a stand up an HTTP API that will take incoming traces being emitted or broadcast from other services. And then we can trace them. So I can see that here, 9411. Now I'm going to make requests. 
here, and I'll send another post like this one. There's the Dr. Dr. Subramaniam again, so I've sent a request there as well. And if I go here, I can see, when I go to the reservation service output here, I can see that there's two different, you know, different endpoints here. I can see that uh, a message arrived at the reservation's endpoint here. And when I, when I look at this, I can see that the message was tran that transited about a minute ago, less than a minute ago. And I can see that there are five spans, and this tells me the length of the request in the system. It took a total of almost 16-something uh, seconds um, to, to send the, the request from the client to the service, et cetera. I can see how long it took at each node and each uh, chain in the invocation. So I can see that it arrived at the reservation client on the reservation names endpoint, then it went to the names method on the client, and then it called the reservation endpoint on the reservation. You know, it sent a request from the reservation client to the reservation's endpoint, where it landed on the reservation service a little bit later, and there it was processed by Spring Data Risk, which we can see here. There we go. So there we go. There's our uh, you know, entity that shows us the information as we expect. Right? We can see details about the request flow, and we can see timings. This is, gives us the ability to see the whole system state, not just the individual host by host and node by node uh, resources. I can also do the same thing for, for example, um, the messaging stuff, right? So I can say, show me all of the messaging, the RabbitMQ exchange. And there's an endpoint there. Click on this. I can see that I made a request. It took four point something milliseconds. The message arrived here, went to the right method, went on the output channel, and then arrived a little bit later on the input channel. And I can see you know, RabbitMQ specific information like the payload, the size, and the type, and so on. So distributed tracing is very, very powerful. Now, what we've done so far is we've built a system that is resilient to failure. We've built a system that uh, is observable. We can understand what it's doing. We have a systems perspective. Oh, I showed you how Spring Cloud Stream can be used to easily stand up um, messaging-based microservices. I showed you that Spring Cloud Stream makes it easy for us to define modules and then use messaging to compose them together. Very much in the same way that you can compose singly focused, unique, standalone, um, standalone uh, uh, utilities from the command line and build interesting solutions by piping them together using the pipes operator on the command line, right? Pipes and filters. If you think about it like that, then you can see there's a lot of possibilities here. We can take our small, singly focused, messaging based microservices and compose them together. We can orchestrate them. And for this, we even have something called Spring Cloud Data Flow. Spring Cloud Data Flow is an approach, uh, it's, a, it's a way of building uh, stream processing solutions out of smaller, singly focused, atomic messaging based microservices. In this case, we've got a messaging based microservice that takes a string in and it writes it to the database. Pretty simple, but it does demonstrate our use case. I'm right now sending one string per post, right? I'm sending the post and then that gets delivered to the downstream service. What if I wanted to build another endpoint that, for example, uh, monitor a directory, and then whenever there's a new directory, it takes the file and it splits the contents of the file into lines, and it sends each one of those as a message to the downstream service. I could use Spring Integration again here, right? But again, that becomes very low level. And if I wanted to build something more sophisticated by composing lots of different services, again, I run into some blocks here. So instead, what we're going to use is we're going to use Spring Cloud Dataflow, which is higher level. So I'll go back to start.spring.io, and I'll say, let's build a data, data flow service. Local data flow server, I'll use the config client and Eureka. And we'll go up here. And I'll say data flow server, at enable discovery client, at enable data flow server, application app properties, spring application name equals data flow service, spring cloud config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888, shift x, OK, bootstrap.properties. Now, this is actually a service that manages different compositions of different services. You can actually plug it in and talk to, make it talk to a database, in which case that those compositions get uh, persisted. We can define these compositions using a bash-like commands-like syntax. And in fact, there's a shell that you can use to talk to this, this service that we're going to stand up. So you can see here, desktop. OK, uh, we need the shell. Grab this. Grab the jar for the release version. Come on. 
things I regret not doing 23 seconds ago. Could have sworn I had this local. Four seconds, three seconds, two seconds. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, keep it, of course. Show in Finder. So there's my jar, CD, dear name. Now, this builds on top of Spring Batch and Spring Integration. So it, it knows how to run long-running jobs, and it can manage them. It can orchestrate the long-running jobs and the uh, streams over uh, Cloud Fabrics, like, for example, Cloud Foundry, right? And Yarn, for example. Uh, I can run the shell very simply. I say Java minus jar. There you go. And it's going to it's going to run and it's going to connect to the local uh, running Dataflow server, which I happen to have just created, right? I created that for you a second ago here on port 9393. Now I can go to my shell and I can say app list, and there's no modules, there's no Lego bricks, if you will, that we can use to build our application. But I've got a very simple, there's already a, uh, sorry, there's already a, a large assortment of, uh, of uh, interesting Lego bricks that we can use that are already aware of RabbitMQ. So let's go ahead and import those and use them in our in distribution here. Okay, app import. And there we go. Now we have a whole bunch of different Lego bricks uh, that will do all sorts of stuff for us. It'll talk to RabbitMQ, to JMS, to you know, S3, to SFTP. We can do integrations with um, WebSockets and all this cool stuff, Cassandra. Uh, and we can add our own as well. Right? That's very, very simple. But in our case, we just want to take advantage of one that is already existing. I want to describe a flow that monitors a directory using the file source, right? the source, and then processes it. So whenever there's a new directory, a new file in that directory, it'll automatically get added. Um, It'll automatically get sent to a destination. So I'm going to create a stream here, and I'm going to deploy it. That's what the stream is doing right here. So, OK, go down here. Let me paste this. Now, if you can read this, it says stream create name. The name of the stream is called file store reservations. The definition is going to be called use the file source, and then uh, the mode will be to split the files by lines. The directory that it's going to monitor is called um, the directory it's going to monitor is called JLong, you know, users JLong desktop in. And I want to route it to the destination, the Spring Cloud Stream reservations destination. And then I want to deploy it right here. So there we go. Now I can go to my directory on my desktop. OK. I've got an in directory here. OK. Copy. And I'm going to cat the file called in.txt from my desktop. I'm going to add those names here. So copy in to in.txt. And now we can see that it's added Eric and David and Artem and you know my friends here uh, from that property file. It's added from the text file. It's looked at the monitored the directory. It's seen that there's a property file there. It's a, a text file there. It's split it by lines. And then it sent each entry to the Spring Cloud Stream destination called reservations in RabbitMQ because we use the RabbitMQ binder. So now, we're, now we've exposed that same microservice via a manual edge service called a, you know, using um, our API gateway. And we use Spring Cloud Dataflow to do it. Spring Cloud Dataflow orchestrates these different components. You can compose them together using the syntax, this DSL, if you will. So you can do really interesting things in this very, very declarative way. Now, we've got 10 more minutes before I have to finish. So I think we have just enough time to cover one last topic, security. Now, in our application, we've got a very simple edge service, and the edge service is available for consumption, but it is the first port of call for services, for requests coming in from the outside. And we want to make sure that those requests are authenticated. We can do this using usernames and passwords, but usernames and passwords don't scale. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to lock down the edge service using Spring Cloud Security and OAuth. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up an auth service, though. I want my auth service, Cloud OAuth 2, Config Client, Eureka Discovery, uh, H2, JPA, web, OK? I'm going to build a custom auth service that's going to be powered by Spring Security OAuth. And I'm going to have to integrate, uh, I'm going to have to teach this auth service a little bit about two things, because OAuth has two things. OAuth is a way of handling security. It does single sign-on. I can reject requests that are made to REST endpoints that don't have a valid token. If they do have a token, that REST endpoint can call this auth service and ask it, is this token valid? And in order to answer that question, we have to answer two 
uh, particular sub-questions. The first one is, what are the valid usernames and passwords? Right? What are the valid users in the system? And then, second of all, what are the valid clients? In OAuth, OAuth is a security technology that is geared very much for the open web, where you have a world of clients and users. It's not just Josh. It's Josh on his HTML5 device, or his Android device, or his uh, you know, iPhone device, or whatever. My identity is not complete unless I have a discussion of what client I'm making the request from. So we need to do that here. We're going to go ahead and do the same kind of stuff. So Spring Cloud, um, Spring Cloud Config URI equals HTTP localhost 8888 Spring that application name equals uh, auth service. I'm going to rename this to be bootstrap.properties. properties. Okay. Delete all that. I'll open this up. And now we have to do a, we have to do a couple things. Remember, we're going to use Spring Security OAuth. Uh, so Spring Security is the first thing that we need to address. We need to teach Spring Security about our usernames and passwords. And if you've ever used Spring Security at all in the last 10 plus years, then you know that it's, at its heart, it's got the idea of an authentication provider, which in turn delegates in a specialized case for to something called a user detail service. So we're going to create a class of type account so that we have you know, some data in a database that we can use uh, to power our fake, uh, you know, mock um, uh, username and user detail service implementation here, okay? So we'll say at ID, at generate value. And we're going to create a two properties, username and password. We're going to create a Boolean called active. We'll create some getters. We'll create a constructor, another constructor for JPA and JP alone, right? And we need a two string, and voila. Okay. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to create. I want to make short work of working with that data, so I'll create a repository using Spring Data again. So extends JPA repository, account, managing I entities of type long, and then I need to create a custom Spring Security user detail service based on account. So I'm going to say account user detail service. Now, mind you, in a, in a typical in, you know scenario, you will already have a useful user detail service or authentication provider implementation that you can use to talk to all manner of different subsystems, be they uh, Kerberos or PAM or LDAP or Active Directory or whatever, right? I just want to have a simple one that uses JPA to look up the details. Uh, in order to answer this contract to implement this service, I need to be able to answer the question, given a username username, what is the user details object that handles that, that, that wraps or describes that user? And the user details is a very simple object in Spring Security. It says, given a username, what are the collection of authorities? These are strings. What is the username? What is the password? And is the account active? Right? These are all mean basically the same thing. Is the account still valid? So I'm going to use my repository to make short work of that query. I'm going to say, optionally, give me an account if it's, if it's available. Otherwise, um, you know, I'll, map, I'll map and do something else instead. So I'm going to use Spring Data to create a declarative client, rest, rest, um, declarative uh, finder method here. I'm going to use my final account repository like this. Create a constructor at AutoWired. Okay. Now I'm going to say this dot account repository at find by username. And whenever somebody calls find by username, I can either map the data to a user details implementation, or as is required by the convention of the, the interface contract, I need to throw an exception, right? So I have to throw a username not found exception if we cannot find the user. We're not allowed to return null. That's the contract here. So no user named username. So I'm going to return now a custom user object. A user is an implementation of the user details interface. And uh, it's pretty simple. I say account.get username, account.get password, account uh, dot is active, and then we have to answer the same question four times, so there we are. And authority utils create authority list, and this is just random strings that you can use to you know, scope out or, or delimit permissions, for example. So I'm going to say role admin, role user, there we are. So I'm saying, when somebody asks me about my users, call this method, I'll use my repository to find the right user, and I'll return it by mapping from an account to a user. Otherwise, um, I'll throw an exception. And of course, I want to have some sample users. So I'll say, uh, you know, account CLR implements command line runner. And this is going to be a component. And there we go. So I'm going to just run through. I'm going to create some sample records here. I'll say stream dot of. And then, of course, my name is Jay Long Spring. It will be my password, pweb 
boot desire cloud, right? And I'll say map each one of those from x to x of split, which is a tuple, basically. And then for each tuple, I'm going to save some data in the database using my account repository, so private final account repository. OK. Goody. Add this to a constructor. And I'll say this dot account repository at save, new account. Uh, and it'll say tuple 0 will be the username, tuple 1 will be the password, and then of course true. Everybody gets an account. Look under your seats, everybody. Everybody gets an account, right? Like the, best like the best episode of Oprah ever, OK? Now, this is Spring Security. All we've done is teach, we've all, all we've done is taught basic Spring Security about usernames and passwords, which is old stuff, right? We need to also activate Spring Security OAuth. So let's go ahead and add the OAuth configuration. I'll say class OAuth configuration extends authorization server configure adapter. And I'm going to override uh, three methods, or two methods, rather. This one and this one. So I have two jobs I have to do here in this authorization config, uh, this OAuth configuration. Hello. At enable auth server. I have to do two things. I have to tell Spring Security OAuth specifically. I have to tell it about the user details service and specifically the authentication manager for that user detail service. So I can say private final authentication manager. This is I'm basically telling Spring Security OAuth about Spring Security. That's all I'm doing right now. I'm injecting the Spring Security Authentication Manager, and I'm configuring Spring Security OAuth here. I'm saying, whoops, endpoints.authenticationmanager, this.authenticationmanager. There we go. And then finally, I need to describe some clients. And again, I can have as many clients as I want. I could use a database, for example. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to just create one called Acme that has the ability to expect a secret called Acme Secret. And I'll give it the uh, grant type password, right? And I'll say scopes is open ID. So a grant type is the kind of uh, uh, flow you're willing to support, right? In this case, I'm willing to say that whenever somebody sends a username and password, I'll give them back a token. In another flow, for example, uh, if I have a more involved flow, I might say uh, I want to redirect them to my trusted domain and then prompt them to approve permission and then redirect back, you know, like the Facebook post to wall kind of prompt, right? But in the, the point is, I'm, I, I'm happy with just username and password exchange. And then finally, I need to tell other microservices, which are going to talk to the uh, auth service that we're standing up here. I need to tell them that if you want to take the token that you've been given and turn it into something that uh, makes sense, you need to call this token your information endpoint, this token URI, right? So I'll say forward slash user principal principal. Okay. So all I'm saying is whenever somebody makes a request using with a token, Spring Security OAuth will turn that token into a Java security principle. And all I'm going to do is return that principle back to the client, which then can use it in its own code on another process, in another node, right? So it's a interesting. And because of that, I need to turn on the fact that this is a resource server. I need to protect my auth service against unprotected requests, naturally. OK, so we've done that. We've got sample data. We've got our simple client. We've got, some, we've got three users and three passwords. Uh, we've configured the uh, user detail service. We can restart this. And then we can go back to the reservation client. And all we need to do, do, do now is lock down the reservation client and forbid access to that service. So let's go here and say at enable resource server by going back to the build and bringing in Spring Cloud Starter OAuth 2. Okay. At enable resource server. OK. So we'll start that. Now, let's take a moment to understand what just happened. We have the ability to have different kinds of clients. right? In the open web, there's different kinds of clients. Thank you. Uh, there's different kinds of clients. And these clients may have the ability to guarantee more than some clients. right? If I have an HTML5 application, HTML5 clients, uh, whoops. HTML, yeah, that's fine. HTML5 clients uh, can't keep secrets. I can view source. And I can see what they're doing, obviously. So I can't make the HTML5 client present a client-specific password. I can make the user present a password, for example. But again, that's you know, a form that they're going to submit. Uh, whereas if I have an iPhone app, 
that's compiled and it's signed and it's distributed through the App Store. And it's, you know, it's, it's very hard to uh, decrypt, for example, to see what's happening. In this case, I can make the client send a password. Because the HTML5 client is very different from a compiled, securely distributed application, maybe I, I want to say that the HTML5 client has less permissions. I can say, when Josh logs in on the HTML5 browser client, give him only uh, access to these things, right? Versus when he logs in on the iPhone app or something, uh, in which case he can have like admin mode, right? The clients determine the kinds of capabilities you can give to these different users. So what we're saying over here in the OAuth uh, auth service is we're saying, We've got different users. We're going to give them all the same roles and admins in this case, but it could be dynamic. And we've also got different kinds of clients. This is Acme, but it could be Acme HTML5, Acme iPhone, Acme Android, whatever. What I'm saying is when, somebody identifying it, when a client identifying itself as Acme makes a request, it has to specify uh, a secret password called Acme secret. And the flow that I'm willing to expect or accept is the password flow, where I send a username and password, and I give back a, a token. The benefit of this, of course, is that the client only keeps the, the key client keeps the token for the rest of its interactions with the service. That limits the surface area where that token is being passed around. This is appropriate if you're building a client for your own services and you trust yourself. Think about the Facebook use case. We've all done this before. We go to Facebook.com and or we go to a website and it says sign in with Facebook. You click the button and it redirects to Facebook.com on a trusted domain and it says, do you approve of uh, this third-party service? Uh, accessing your information and and uh, you know do you approve of uh, this uh, of this third party service posting to your wall and spamming your friends your family and your loved ones mercilessly and endlessly until they hate you and you and you say yeah absolutely go for it right go do it faster so you hit the button and it redirects you back to the the third party service with an access token in tow that access token is used by the third party service to access the facebook.com APIs on your behalf at no point does the third party API have your username and password that makes sense for third-party APIs and clients. But the alternative is if, if you're Facebook.com and you're building Facebook.app, the Facebook iOS app or the Android app, in this case, it makes no sense for Facebook to redirect to Facebook.com and ask you if Facebook has permission to access your Facebook. right? Of course they have access. They have the right to do that. They, they trust themselves. And the user experience would be very poor if you had to do that ridiculous flow for that. So you can have different exchanges. That's what we're doing here. We're saying the grant type in this case is password. I trust my client to transmit your username and password in the, in the uh, client itself, as opposed to being redirected to facebook.com. So now I've got an off service. Let's see if it works by go ahead and generating a token here. I'm going to use a, a browser plugin called Postman, because while I do love doing things live, I believe that calling the auth service and getting a token like this uh, can be a little bit painful. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm sending two headers, accept and application JSON. And I'm going to say that I am going to send the client ID and the client password here. And then I'm going to send all of this in the body. So I'm going to say I'm going to send, I'm making a request to, to get a token here to uh, this endpoint. And I'm going to say that the password is spring, the username is jlong, the grant type is password, the scope that I'm trying to get access for is open ID. Remember, I can say that I want read only access. Or I want, you know, uh, to write to wall or to, to put tweet from your Twitter account, whatever. Right? These are arbitrary strings that mean something different to your system. Uh, client secret, client ID, etc. Hit send. And there I'm given an access token. And now I can use this access token to call my protected microservice, the reservation client. And to understand how that's working, let's go visit the reservation client here. I added at neighbor resource server. At Enable Resource Server is using Spring Cloud Security and Spring Cloud OAuth, right? It's going to lock down the request to that edge service. And it's going to say, whenever somebody makes a request, if they have a token, I'm going to call a token exchange endpoint, a token URI endpoint, uh, which we specified in the configuration. And that token exchange endpoint is in the auth service itself. So we say curl minus h. Actually, we'll just say curl HTTP localhost 9999 reservations names. Now, this is me making an unauthenticated request. And it says, full authentication is required to access this resource. OK. Minus H authorization, colon, bearer, paste. And there we go. Now I'm able to call the edge service and get the data back. And just to prove the negative here, we'll make the same request, except now I'll tamper with the token a little bit. And it says, invalid token. So I've, I've now protected my edge service against requests that are coming in from outside 
by using Spring Cloud Security. <sighs> OK. So my friends, that was a quick, very, very brief, very short look at just some of the things you can do with Spring Cloud. I know we didn't get to cover a lot this time. Maybe next time. Uh, what I want to really stress here is that we talked about the four tenets of building a cloud-native system, four things that are very important. Your system has to be amenable to agile iteration. It has to be able to benefit from the elasticity of a cloud, of a cloud and scale out. It has to do the right thing, given the uh, implicit com complexity implied by building a distributed system. And it has to be observable. And I've talked to you about how we can support all these different things with Spring Cloud today. I hope you liked it. Did you see anything in this that you liked? Anybody? OK, just making sure. I hope you'll vote as such. Uh, I hope you liked it, but you don't have to take my word for it. Naturally, I'm up here wearing a spring t-shirt and spring underwear. Of course I like it, right? But there are other companies out there that, are, that also like it. And a lot of them are here at the show right now. There's a small company in China called Alibaba. How many of you know Alibaba? Last year, they had a single day where they sold $16 billion in 24 hours. Uh, they're building. Yes, love you guys. Yeah. So th they're doing amazing stuff with Spring Cloud at scale. Right? and Spring Boot. There's another one in China called Baidu. That's a search engine. They serve 400 to 600 million people a day uh, in China. Again, third largest search engine in the world, also Spring Boot and Spring Cloud in several of their services. There's another company in Japan, which is called Rakuten. Rakuten is a, like, if, if Alibaba is uh, Amazon for China, then Rakuten is, is Amazon for Japan. Or maybe, given the numbers, maybe Amazon is Alibaba for America. I don't know. Anyway, um, the point is, these, that's another one that's using Spring Cloud and Spring boot at extraordinary scale. Actually, Rakuten's also using Cloud Foundry. Same with Yahoo Japan. Uh, there's a company here in, in the States, just down the street in, in California, in Los, Altos, Los Altos, called Netflix. And they're using Spring Cloud. And they're, gonna, they're here as well. I think they're even giving a talk, talking about how they're using this stuff at scale. You see, for these organizations and many others besides, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry are not just toolkits for building applications, they re represent the fastest, most comprehensive way to build production-worthy services. These organizations, of course, had to solve these problems themselves before. Alibaba had solutions for this stuff before uh, in different ways. Right? But now with Spring Cloud and same thing for Netflix, of course, they had to solve these problems before, for example. For these organizations, this represents an opportunity to rebase, to let the framework do more of the heavy lifting, and they can focus on the thing that matters, which is delivering valuable software at scale. As we've seen, there are lots of different use cases that you need to care about when you build distributed systems. The benefit of moving to the microservices architecture is agility. You have the ability to go faster, to have teams that, you know, quote unquote, stay in their own, own lane, they swim in their own lane. This gives you a lot of velocity, but the cost is distributed systems complexity. Hopefully, you've seen today that a lot of that has been cared for. We've got the patterns and primitives to be able to address those, uh, those concerns in a distributed system. Uh, I encourage you, my friends, to please uh, note again this uh, URL, GitHub URL. So github.com, Cloud Native Workshop, et cetera. Uh, there you'll find information on a lot of the stuff we just talked about today. I'm going to update it to include the data flow bit, but everything else is there. Um, the other thing I want you to remember is that what did we do today? I think I have seven or eight Java running processes right now. There's the reservation client, the reservation service, the config service, the Eureka registry, the Hystrix dashboard, Zipkin, auth service, data flow service, right? That's eight things. I only care about two of those, right? So you're going to want to you want to you want to develop the recipe for getting these bits stood up and correctly configured and running, and then reuse that recipe over and over again, right? If you're using a modern platform like Cloud Foundry. Those things are just built in and baked in for you. Right? You don't have to recreate them each time. Uh, I've also done the kind of bare bones versions of stuff here. Right? None of this is hardened or uh, you know, it's not the production worthy thing. You can get there, of course. But I've just done the very simple out of the box white label uh, sort of demo here. So I hope you keep that in the back of your mind. What you want is automation. You want velocity through automation. Uh, I'm also available on the Twitter, so I'm happy to talk to you if you have questions afterwards. Um, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Please vote if you liked it. I appreciate it very much. Cheers.